Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about what should I eat for diabetes. Okay, now I'm going to summarize exactly what we are going to talk about and you decide if you want to watch the entire video or not. I am Dr. Ahmed Ergin, I'm the founder of SugarMDs.com and today you are going to get a very nice comprehensive review of diet and diabetes. Now we are going to talk about why diet is so important for diabetes, right? And we are going to give you some secrets about losing weight, how to lose weight with diabetes. We are going to talk about carbohydrate consistency, why it is so important to be consistent with carbohydrates. We are going to talk about carbohydrate counting, if you want to be precise with carbohydrate counting, especially if you're on multiple daily insulin injections, sometimes you have to be, and we will talk about how to count carbs precisely. We are going to talk about the serving size, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, how much you should eat, how, how do you calculate, and the, at the end of the video, we are going to talk about what should I eat. And uh, with that, let's move on. Before we jump into the details, I want to explain to you what diabetes is. So if you're a new diabetic, most of the time people do not really understand why they became diabetic. Of course, genetic factors contribute to it, but the bottom line, especially for type 2 diabetics, right? So what happens is in time, our body becomes insulin resistant. So insulin is the hormone that allows your body to utilize the glucose, which is the primary energy source. So, if your body is not able to get that glucose within the cells, then you're not going to feel good, your blood sugars will stay high, it's like you have million dollars locked in the bank, but you cannot pull your money. That's, that's miserable, right? So, the most of the time, that's how patients with type 2 diabetes feel, they're tired, um, and they keep gaining weight. Also, the reason for gaining weight, again, the problem with type 2 diabetes is not necessarily totally deficiency of insulin. They do not respond in normal or even high levels of insulin. So most patients with type 2 diabetes actually have high insulin levels, not low, but they are unfortunately insulin resistant and that is a problem, especially every time they eat a carbohydrate containing food, their blood sugar tend to rise quickly because the insulin they have in their system is not working properly. Okay, let's talk about why diabetes is so important. Now, when we treat anybody with diabetes, we have something called ABC of diabetes, right? So A is your A1C. So if you do not know what A1C means, or you may have a little idea, but not, not too much, you can definitely go to our website. We have an entire article about that at sugarmds.com forward slash diabetes dash education. Uh, so, or just go to our website and go to the Diabetes Education tab and you will find our article about that. Now, uh, A is the A1C, right? And then B is the blood pressure and C is the cholesterol. So, if you bring your A1C down but do not control your blood pressure or your cholesterol, then you will still have problems. As we discussed in our previous videos, two-thirds of patients with diabetes die from heart attacks or strokes and these happen not just because of a high blood sugar but they also have accompanying blood pressure and cholesterol problems and every time your blood sugar is high your blood pressure and cholesterol goal is even normal than a normal individual so you may get hit with a blood pressure of 150 over 90 with diabetes way faster than somebody who does not have diabetes cholesterol is the same way a normal cholesterol doesn't necessarily uh, mean normal for a patient with diabetes, their um, upper level is much lower when you have diabetes. So for example, the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol should be less than 100 for every diabetic. Although the upper limit of normal can go up to 160 when you run a blood test, it may look okay in a regular for a regular person, but when you have diabetes, your goal of LDL is much lower because in the environment of high glucose, the cholesterol uh, makes a bigger impact 
to block your arteries and cause a heart attack. So as a result, when we talk about diet for diabetes, we are not only targeting your blood sugar, but we are also targeting your blood pressure and then your cholesterol as well. Of course, the key to improve your ABC for diabetes is losing weight. So how do we really lose weight then, right? So I'm going to give you a quick formula in terms of how much calories you should eat, right? So that's a common question that I get from my diabetic patients is, doctor, how much should I eat? Now, of course, counting calories and counting carbs is going to be extremely useful, but if you don't know what you're count counting to, then that's not really going to help you, right? So you can count your calories, but if you're counting your 5,000 calories every day, of course, there's too much, everybody would know that, but if you don't know your personal goal, then you will never achieve the weight loss goals, which will improve your A1C, your blood pressure, and your cholesterol. Now, how do you determine uh, how much you should eat to lose weight? So, first you determine what is your basal uh, caloric needs, right? So, uh, or overall needs. For any individual who is an active, let's say talk about an active man. And men and women are different, age makes a difference sometimes, but let's talk about an active man. When I say active man, somebody who is always out at work, uh, who works out, and, and, and those people generally require 15 calories per pound. So if you are 200 pound individual, that means that you're really you know muscular and fit, uh, you're gonna need around 15 times 200. That is around 3,000 calories. That is to maintain your weight. So if you're a sedentary man, if you're a woman, uh, then you're probably or an active woman, I would say. An active woman, woman uh, and sedentary man uh, will need uh, 13 calories per pound. Why am I putting the sedentary man and active woman just in the same bucket? Just because overall men burn more energy, more calories, they are, they're more muscular, their bone mass is bigger. It's just a natural thing that the men burn more calories at the same uh, weight. So as a result, um, 13 calories is if you're sedentary and if you're a woman, active woman, we are looking around 13 calories per pound to maintain your weight. Okay, now uh, the next uh, uh, next class would be uh, sedentary women or women who's uh, after menopausal or after in their 40s. Uh, generally, they need 10 calories per pound to maintain their weight. Again, these are ballpark figures. You may have a high metabolism or lower metabolism, but that's not gonna be like 50 to 60% difference. If you are an individual with low metabolism, maybe you will have a 20% less needs than a person with a high metabolism. Um, the common problem we see all the time is um, uh, underestimation of calories. Uh, it, the studies show that when men and women estimate that they're eating 1500 calories, they are typically eating around 2000, but they underestimate down to 1500. And that's because of the calculation problems, but also psychologically, we tend to underestimate um, that. So uh, if you're a pregnant woman, that would be around 15 to 17 uh, calories per pound. So once you determine that how much you need, uh, you need to subtract 500 to 1000 calories from that a number in order to lose one to two pounds of um, weight a week and that is the healthy amount of weight that you can lose so let's say a, a sedentary man uh, or or a, let's say sedentary women uh, age of 42 and she is 150 pounds so her needs are 1500 calories right so for her to lose one pound a week she should go down to 1,000 calories. And when I say 1,000 calories, I mean it. That means that you have to calculate and be serious about, you know, when you're counting your carbs. And now we're gonna move on to, you know, how to count carbohydrates and consistency and so forth. And that's going to give you a very good idea. Okay, let's start with carbohydrate consistency and carbohydrate counting. The reason we emphasize carbohydrate consistency in a lot of individuals is if you know what is coming in then your medications can be adjusted a lot easier right so so if you are on 
uh, let's say a glipizide or glyburide or glimipiride, uh, when the doctors give you that medication, your insulin levels go up. So if you are not providing a steady amount of uh, glucose to your system, uh, then your blood sugars will drop. Now, doctors will give you a dose based on what they estimate your needs are. And let's say you're taking five milligram of glipizide, right? And then you are eating 60 grams of carbohydrates per meal and that is helping you out, great. Uh, you're not gaining weight, you're not losing weight, that is perfect. Uh, if you are gaining weight, that means that we have to cut down on your calories, including your carbohydrates. So sometimes we tell them to eat 45 grams, but that comes with the reduction in the medication dose as well. So I always tell my patients, do not change your diet drastically without telling me because the medications you're on is based on what your needs are at that time. If your needs change, your medications needs to change as well. And when you are not an expert in this area, when you try to manage yourself and you doctor yourself, most of the time you will get put yourself into trouble. So please do not do that. So carbohydrate consistency is also important for people, as we said, taking oral medications, but uh, for patients who are taking insulin as well, if they're not willing to count carbs, as we discussed in our previous video, where I talk about how to take insulin safely, uh, we uh, get into detail about this. Uh, but here I'm going to explain uh, briefly that if you are consistent with your carbohydrates per meal, then your insulin is also consistent, then they are going to match and you should not have any problem, right? So we are going to talk about how to really estimate because you cannot always look at the label. Sometimes you just have to estimate. And to estimate, we look at the, um, the hand. Our hand is the best guide. So a fist will equal to a one cup of carbohydrates. So if you just make a small fist, look at the food, look at your fist, you can estimate that that will be a one cup of uh, that carbohydrate. Uh, if your palm could be equal to three ounces. Again, the thickness of your palm and the, the width of your palm would determine uh, three ounces of uh, food. Typically, we use ounces for the protein. Uh, your thumb uh, will be around one ounce of uh, food. So these are uh, just general guidelines to help you. Uh, now with carbohydrate counting, uh, if you want to uh, get more education and training and want to be more into it and adjust your insulin as you go, because some people are not very regular. they just they're younger maybe or their lifestyle is uh, different they eat outside and so forth uh, they may not be very consistent they may not uh, meal prep or they may not be home or whatever it may be uh, those people need more flexibility for those patients um, especially if you're on insulin uh, for them to be able to adjust their insulin let's say one day at lunch they are taking five units next day they are taking 10 units next day they are taking eight units they can do that as long as they know what is their insulin to carb ratio is, which means that if they know how much insulin they need for a certain amount of carbs, let's say if let's say they need one unit for 15 grams of carbs, then they know that if they're eating 45 grams of carbs, then they are getting three units of insulin, uh, or if it is one unit for 10 grams of carbs, then if they are eating thir uh, 45 grams, then they're gonna get four to five units of insulin. Uh, so we are going to jump into now uh, how to uh, actually uh, estimate uh, how to do a plate method where we actually, uh, especially if you're a new uh, diabetic, we uh, explain to you, you know, how, you, how to create a plate. Let's move on to that right now. Okay, this is how a plate should look like for pretty much any healthy individual, but also patients with diabetes. So basically, you should have one fourth of your plate consisting of carbs and this carbs should be right around the size of a small computer mouse does it look like a mouse yes it does now your meats also should be one fourth of your plate and that should be at least three ounces uh, but depending on your body size and protein requirement uh, you can definitely eat more protein the key here is to eat a lean protein. That could be a lean uh, uh, chicken uh, or fish, 
fish, fatty fish is okay because it's healthy fat. Uh, but for example, a red meat has a lot of unhealthy saturated fat, so we are avoiding that. Uh, however, uh, non-fatty uh, lean meats are okay. And if you are big and if you're working out trying to build muscle, it is okay to have more meat unless you have special contraindications. Now, the uh, grains are okay to have as much as possible, at least half of your plate. Uh, one cup of uncooked vegetables is only five grams, so you don't have to count that. You only start counting these uh, green vegetables if you are eating more than three cups, which is more than 15 grams of carbohydrates. Since we talked about the plate method, now I want to talk to you about the exchange system. Now, once you determine that you want to have three servings of carbs, for example, in the one fourth of your plate, uh, then uh, then you have the right to change now. But you have to really know uh, how much of uh, of a rice is how much of a pasta. One serving of a pasta versus one serving of a potato versus one serving of a rice, one serving of a bread. So as long as you understand that exchange concept, then then I can tell you that, for example, eat three uh, 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 servings of carbs, then that three servings could be three different carbs if you're having uh, one serving of each, or you can have two serving of one carb and one serving of another type of carb, uh, then that also will fit the bill. So we talked about um, dividing our plate. We talked about having one third of uh, one fourth of the plate as carbs and one fourth as protein uh, and one half as um, uh, raw vegetables, salads, etc. Now, how do we really estimate and how we really come up with a quick determination? Uh, so basically, um, if you're having pasta, one third of a cup would be your um, your uh, your um, 15 grams of carbs, which is one serving. For rice, that is also one third of a cup. For potato, boiled potato, it is half of a cup. Uh, for bread, it's one slice. Uh, for corn, it is half of a cup. Um, again, uh, the computer mouse can give you a size estimation in terms of your pasta, rice, potato, uh, as far as one starch choice uh, as 15 grams uh, and if you have um, the whole cup of pasta or whole cup of rice that means that you're having three choice which is total of 45 grams since one choice is around 15 grams again you can change you don't have to eat the same things you just have to be consistent in terms of total carbohydrates you eat uh, in most cases or if you're counting carbs you can uh, take a very a variable amount of insulin depending on how much carbs you're eating but if your doctor prescribed you a fixed amount of insulin per meal and uh, prescribed you a certain amount of carbs uh, and if that is easier for you to do so rather than just uh, keep counting carbs then you can just um, estimate how much carbs you're eating trying to stick to your uh, ballpark figure around 45 to 60 or whatever is recommended for you um, and you can exchange pasta to rice, rice to potato, bread to corn, whatever you feel like eating. You, all you have to know is how much of that food is equal to one exchange, which is 15 grams of carbs. When it comes to your protein, uh, this is your um, size, size of a deck of a card. Uh, cards that is basically is telling you that it's around three ounces. Uh, you can use your palm as we discussed, so that is another way of doing it. Um, so palm of your uh, hand is around three ounces, or you can just imagine uh, a, a size of a deck of cards. So you can this could be this could be chicken, it, this could be fish or or beef, whatever it may be. For those people, for those people who actually want to precisely count carbs, uh, it takes time and effort. Uh, yes, you know, sitting down with the educator helps, but the educator is not going to infuse the information to your brain and lock it in. So uh, now I'm going to show you a table where you can actually see commonly uh, eaten carbs, uh, commonly chosen carbs by uh, many of us. Uh, and once you practice it, once you 
understand what you're doing, what you're eating commonly, uh, then it's going to, the repetition is the key, you know, once you understand uh, how, much, uh, how much of a rice you're eating and how much of a carb is that, or how much of a bread you're eating and how much of a carb is that, then you get the hang of it. Then you don't have to uh, necessarily uh, open a book or Google things or, um, you know, uh, or go to your app to uh, necessarily find out. Uh, so once you know, you know uh, that that becomes an essential information for you. Um, but I think that is the key, understanding. So let's go to commonly uh, consumed carbohydrates and we'll take it from there. So I am going to give you this table here to give you an idea. You can take a screenshot if you want to. Basically, this gives you a serving size or portion for common foods that we typically eat and like and enjoy. Right, so let's go over a few of this. The bread part that where most of my patients love, for example, bagel. I test my patients, for example, uh, how much uh, one bagel contain how much carbs one bagel contain and they will most of the time not know they will make estimations but half the time or more than half the time they're wrong and I think uh, an educated patient is the best patient in my opinion uh, you do not have to be smart you don't have to be rich you don't have to be um, tax savvy all you have to know is your carbohydrates an educated patient is the best patient in my eyes uh, because that will help you in the long run and in the short run uh, to determine the best way of managing your diabetes uh, as this is the fundamental of diabetes care where we most of the time fall short. Now one bagel will be around uh, 60 grams. Why? Because one-fourth of the bagel uh, is around 15 grams right so that is our one serving is only one fourth of a bagel so if you're eating the whole bagel you're eating 60 grams right so one serving is 15 grams that uh, the whole bagel will be 60 grams if you look at bread if it is a very reduced calorie which is hard to find but if you do you can have two slices of those uh, more like a typical bread uh, if you look at the label if the if the one serving is 15 grams then it's 15 grams if the one serving is 10 grams it's 10 grams you just need to know how much it is uh, per slice English muffin typically is 30 grams the total thing so half of that will be only one serving which is your 15 uh, grams I wouldn't I don't want to call it one serving because you do not just have to have just 15 grams which is uh, too little actually uh, so most of us will eat 45 60 or 75 depending on your activity level uh, so as a result um, as long as you know that half of an English muffin is your 15 gram exchange then when you know that you're eating two English muffins you're pretty much having 60 grams of total carbohydrates or four servings of total carbohydrates. Your pancake is around one. Uh, your pita, six inches across, is um, if you're having half of that pita, that would be 15 grams. One plain roll um, would be um, a one serving. A taco shell, uh, five inches across, will be two serving, which is 30 grams. A tortilla is one. A waffle is one if it is four by four. Again, your cereals, your couscous, your granola, grits, pasta, you can find all these here. Um, for your information, I'm not going to go over it because that is really a long list here. Again, your fruits, a lot of people ask me, you know, what should they eat? We have a separate video in terms of the fruits and how much fruits can be eaten and their serving size, etc. Uh, but if you look at here, for example, banana is a lot of people's favorite. A half a banana, around 4 ounces, uh, will be your 15 grams. So if you are having a, a sizable banana, a full banana, then that will be around uh, 30 grams of carbs. Uh, on the other hand, um, apple, one small apple will be 15 grams. Um, uh, cherries, 12 of them, would be uh, uh, 15 grams. Uh, three dates would be 
15 grams and so forth. Uh, again, uh, the fruits have different glycemic indexes, so you need to pay attention to that as well. My favorite fruits are blueberries, blackberries, um, and let's see, orange is good in terms of the glycemic index being low, uh, strawberries are good, raspberries are good, watermelon is not that good, so you have to pay attention to that, grapes are not that great, honeydew is not good, these, uh, these ones, uh, when I say not good, I mean it's going to spark your blood sugar due to glycemic index. But uh, bottom line, uh, this is a good uh, list and you can uh, definitely Google anything. If you just Google and say, okay, you know, whatever that could be, just write it down, at, let's say an apple and just put a space and carbs, Google will pull up from millions of websites exactly what you're looking for and will pop up onto your face and that is as easy as that for people with smartphones that's great uh, for our less tech savvy patients or older patients I recommend them to carry a carbohydrate um, a book uh, which is um, not that difficult it is a small book and uh, as I said before if you continue to practice that you will be a pro you'll be an expert you will not have to look at uh, carbohydrate content in an apple every day if you are eating apple every day right so you will be able to remember that and that that will make your life easier in time okay finally we are going to talk about uh, reading labels so basically uh, if you are shopping uh, and you have diabetes or not I recommend everybody to know how to read labels that is going to uh, give you an idea what you're putting to your system uh, you could be an athlete you could be a regular guy like just like me or you could be a patient with diabetes regardless of the fact that you should understand what you're eating in terms of total carbohydrates uh, fat trans fat saturated fat protein what you're eating uh, makes your body and changes your health so as a result uh, if you're diabetes, of course, you have to be more meticulous about this, but uh, I'm going to go over right now how to read labels and you will be a pro with practice. Okay, we will talk about uh, reading the nutrition labels. Very, very important. If you make it a habit of reading the nutrition labels, you are going to be a pro before you know it. So, uh, I do that. Um, I don't have diabetes, but I'm a diabetes expert. And I feel like I have to know what I'm doing before I teach anyone else. And I think anyone who is fit and who's into health and fitness always look at the nutrition facts regardless of if they have diabetes or not. So when you have diabetes, that's an extra incentive. That is not an obligation. That is not, a, you know, that's not a torture for you. That is something you should seriously be doing anyways. So let's look at how we read those nutrition facts now number one you have to look at how many servings in that container so they put this calories big here 230 but that is per serving so you're looking for eight times 230 so if you are looking to eat this whole package good luck with that you are going to get around uh, 1700 or more calories just from this this packaged food right so basically you look at the serving size next that is two-thirds of a cup so that means that everything that is listed here that is total fat your total carbohydrates and protein are within the two-thirds of a cup of this food that is one serving size so if you are thinking to eat one cup then you have to think accordingly for example if there is 37 grams of total carbohydrates in this food per serving and that is two-thirds of a cup you can make the math and you can say okay well one-third then would be uh, think about this if this 37 gram is two-third then what would be the uh, one-third of a cup uh, that would be pretty much half of this right so if the two-third of a cup is 37 then one third of a cup would be half of this. Uh, so that would be around 
18 grams. So if you are looking for the whole cup, that would be 18 times 3, which is 54 grams. So basically, if you are looking to eat one cup of this, which is more than one serving, then you can adjust your total carbohydrates being 54. So you can make your calculations accordingly. Uh, so if you are eating a fixed amount of carbs per meal, let's say you're trying to stick to 60 grams of carbs, that 54 grams almost puts you to your target. Um, and then you can look into how much protein you're getting. So if you have a protein goal, um, you know, as we discussed, an average sedentary man uh, eats around 50 to 60 grams of carbs. But if you are more into um, uh, sports, you're more active and you're uh, working out, uh, lifting weights, you may definitely need more than that, uh, and, and as much as twice or even more than that uh, if you're burning it out and if you're building muscle. Um, on the other hand, you also have to look at your total fat. The next thing you need to look at is saturated fat. You want to keep the saturated fat less than 10% in our diet. So, uh, so basically what you're looking here is 5% is of that food is saturated fat. So that is that not necessarily a bad thing because it is less than 10%. So anything you eat should have less than 10% saturated fat. Trans fat is zero, which is great that's something we try to avoid we do not want to have trans fat in our diet uh, processed foods most processed foods have trans fats margarines hydrogenated oils uh, especially those cookies pastries they all have a lot of trans fat so that is your biggest enemy uh, so you need to totally avoid that um, saturated fats are okay up to 10 percent as we said you pay attention to big time to your total carbohydrates Again, you even when you buy rice or you buy bread, most things are in packages nowadays, and you just have to have a quick, quick glimpse to see how much carbs they have per serving, and then you will figure it out. And then again, you know, if you're buying same things again and again and eating again and again, which most people do and we all do, uh, then you do not have to look at that because you have something called memory, right? You will memorize this next time. Uh, unless you are buying something totally different, then you will have to look at their nutrition facts. But if it is something that you already know, then then that is that becomes easier and easier as you go along, as you pay attention to your nutrition labels. Okay, the striking question finally: What should I really eat? Right. So most people. Um, know what they're eating but they don't know necessarily if it is good or not so let's make a general statements here where you can pick what you want to eat from these choices so in terms of carbohydrates as you all know lots of fruits and vegetables legumes uh, food with high fiber content right uh, low fat low fat dairy, dairy is okay as well uh, so carbohydrate wise you, you can eat carbohydrates how much carbs you should eat that is based on your needs some people will need as low as 30 grams of carbs per meal with some snacks in between maybe 15 grams of snacks uh, some people will need up to 60 75 grams or more carbohydrates if they are very active individuals so as we discussed about the caloric needs, so once you determine your caloric needs, uh, around 40 to 50 percent of that can be carbohydrates. So as long as you're burning these carbohydrates and not letting the blood sugar go high uh, and you're maintaining your weight or even losing weight, uh, then uh, even if you're eating 60 to 75 grams of carbs per meal, is not going to really uh, be a problem. Like personally, I eat uh, around 75 grams of carbs per meal, uh, but I work out a lot. As a result, uh, I do not gain weight. If I was a patient with diabetes, I would have taken enough insulin to cover my carbohydrates. So I make sure that these sugars are going to my muscles and then I burn that uh, sugar later with the exercise uh, and for my daily activities, of course. Uh, so as a result, as long as you maintain your, your, your um, weight, uh, carbohydrate depends on your needs.
Now, as we discussed in, discussed in our um, article in our website, again, in the sugarmds.com under diabetes education, which diet is best for diabetics. Uh, there I talk about in detail, but my favorite is the Mediterranean diet. I'm a Mediterranean, I'm from Turkey, but I mean, that's, that's, that is one of the reasons that I prefer Mediterranean, but that's the only diet actually has been proven uh, to uh, reduce the mortality, which is dying from heart attacks and strokes. It has been proven to reduce the number of medications we give to patients. Uh, so as a result, Mediterranean diet is your best friend. Of course, um, you can do low fat diet, low carb diet, low salt diet, whatever it may be, as long as we are keeping your calories low and you are eating the right foods, uh, you are still okay. So when you're on a low fat diet, for example, that doesn't mean that you can go eat all the other carbs out there. You, you still have to choose the right, uh, right amount of carbs. When you are on a low carbohydrate diet, um, some people, for example, follow these ketogenic diets and so forth, but they end up eating so much saturated fat that their cholesterol go up and that's not our goal, right? So we have to make sure we control A, B, and C, your A1C, your cholesterol and your um, uh, your blood pressure at the same time. So we are looking to have high potassium, which comes from your uh, veggies and fruits, uh, that reduces your blood pressure, right? And then you choose the right carbohydrates, which is uh, low glycemic index carbohydrates, carbohydrates with high fiber, that will help. And uh, of course, uh, when you are uh, eating in a Mediterranean diet, for example, you eat carbohydrates, proteins, and, and fat. When you choose fat, you need to choose fat with very low saturated fat. So uh, it is recommended to have less than 10% saturated fat in your diet. Again, saturated fats are commonly found in animal fat. So if you can avoid animal fat like steaks or red meat, uh, if you're eating red meat, it has to be really, really uh, lean. Um, but if you're eating chicken, for example, taking the skin off um, or trying to stick with the chicken breast uh, or turkey uh, will be really beneficial. Uh, that way you are getting the lean protein without the saturated fat in your diet. One thing that you have to totally avoid is trans fat. Trans fat recommendation for a, in a person's diet for any individual is zero. So trans fat never helps you. That is the basic source of heart attacks and strokes. So uh, hydrogenated oils commonly used in processed foods and commonly used in bakery. That's why we always tell patients avoid, avoid, avoid. Unfortunately, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, uh, fall uh, for our diabetic patients are bakery. Um, you know, of course, everybody likes bakery. Uh, you, you just need to limit it to as low as possible. So if, you're, if you like cookies, if you like to have cookies once a day, every day, instead of having three, four cookies, just have one. Take a walk after that. Uh, limit it, and I think you will still be, uh, you'll still be winning. Um, but if you can totally avoid it, that's going to give you the best health ever. Now, uh, now we talked about the carbohydrates, uh, we talked about the fat content. Uh, you are looking for polyunsaturated fat, which are found in sunflower oil, canola oil, and olive oil, right? Uh, nuts are extremely important. You know, when you are having nuts, actually, that not only satisfies your hunger, but also gives a good amount of fat. So we do not necessarily tell patients avoid fat totally, but you can have healthy fats such as olive oil, uh, uh, nuts, uh, canola oil are all fine. We do not recommend frying things uh, just because it increases your overall calories. Remember, when you're on a diet, you always have to keep your total calories in mind as we discussed in our previous, uh, in, our, in the beginning of the video. You have to always keep in mind how much calories you are getting. And when things are fried, you know their calorie count goes sky high. No matter how healthy uh, the fat is, the overconsumption will still make you gain weight. And when you gain weight, you become insulin resistant, your cholesterol goes high anyways. So as a result, we have to keep our calories down, eat healthy fat, eat uh, the right amount of carbohydrates, and the right carbohydrates, 
and when it comes to the carbohydrates as we discussed it needs to be low glycemic index try to keep your glycemic index below 60 in most of carb most of the carbohydrates you eat try to eat fiber in your diet around 25 to 30 grams of uh, fiber is recommended in a person's diet uh, in, that includes patients with diabetes and when you count your carbohydrates, it is okay to take the fiber off. So if you're having 45 grams of carbs, but, but there's 10 grams of fiber in that, it is okay to count as 35. We call that net carbs. So I hope that video was helpful to you. And if it is, uh, please give a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for many more videos to come so you don't miss anything.